businesses plead for the government to resolve foreign currency issues. Parliamentary Committee calls for the abolishment of Teaching Services Commission. And more than 900 students graduate from Unitech. This is National MTV News with Meriba Tolo. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Friday's news. Lay's captains of industries have raised concerns about the lack of foreign currency circulating in the economy that is affecting their operations. Today, KK Kingston CEO Michael Kingston pleaded with the national government to float the Kina despite the impact it will have on its value. Bethany Harriman with this report. Michael Kingston runs KK Kingston, one of Papua New Guinea's oldest and biggest manufacturing companies that was started by his father, Keith, in the early 1970s. This morning he spoke out about the difficulty lay manufacturing companies are facing when paying for services and supplies. There have been restrictions placed by the national government and the central bank on how foreign currency is spent. KK Kingston CEO Michael Kingston says if the Kina is floated, businesses will be able to operate with some level of comfort. The only way to fix it at this point is to refloat the currency. Now overnight, that's going to cause a lot of pain. The, Kina, the value of the Kina will drop, there's no doubt. And in the short term, there'll be a lot of pain. But in the long term, there'll be a lot more liquidity in the economy. It'll make exports a lot more competitive, whether it's fisheries, agriculture or anything else. But my government, national government. Michael Kingston was speaking at a panel facilitated by the Oxford Business Group that will be broadcasted by MTV. He was part of a panel this morning that discussed the difficulties faced by the PNG economy at this time. Lay business houses need foreign currency circulating in the economy to pay for services provided by suppliers from overseas. But most importantly, it'll allow business to continue as normal. And right now, it's like trying to run through, through honey. It's nearly impossible because you just can't get the money to pay your suppliers. So I, I, I plead with the government, we have to do something about this foreign exchange crisis. It is. Most lay businesses in all sectors need to pay for services and supplies from overseas in US dollars. That has become increasingly difficult with all the restrictions placed on foreign currency by the central bank and the national government. This morning at the panel, the heads of all the companies in every sector pleaded to the government to fix the problem. Bethany Hariman, National MTV News, Lay. A report on the constant late delivery of teachers' leave fares has recommended the abolishment of the Teaching Services Commission. The Special Parliamentary Committee on Public Sector Reform and Service Delivery said even though the Teaching Services Commission is the lead agency in the employment of teachers in the country, they have neglected their responsibilities. The report, which is expected to be presented in Parliament next week, points out administrative issues that have been dragging on for far too long. The complaint by teachers regarding their live fair entitlement has almost become an annual issue for the education sector. The issue of teachers' live fair entitlements continues to affect almost 50,000 teachers nationwide every year. The report has been completed after two years of fact-finding and is now expected to be presented in Parliament next week. That does not take away um, some of the good work done by another parliamentary committee headed by the member for Warbeck, uh, which is Parliamentary Committee on Education. So they've done a decent job. What this committee um, endeavored to do was to establish why we have the systemic problems, what is the way forward, and how can we resolve once and for all uh, this um, issue of unpaid teachers' leave fairs that's been going on for quite some time. Chairman of the Special Parliamentary Committee on Public Sector Reform and Service Delivery, Bire Kimisopa, is looking forward to presenting the report in Parliament and said the recommendations are aimed at making the system a lot easier. There are two main recommendations. The first is that teachers' live fares be paid fortnightly, pro rata, and tax-free. What we're proposing is that it's, it be pro rata, paid into 26 installments per fortnight. So they get the money up front, tax-free. So if they decide to go to live, they go. If they don't, they stay. It's entirely up to them. So we can, we can um, reduce the, um, 
the absentee rates. The second recommendation in the report is that the Teaching Services Commission be abolished because the Commission says it has outlived its usefulness. We, we felt that it was uh, inappropriate at this time because they're the lead agency uh, with respect to um, the employments of, of teachers in the country. They set the terms and condition and how the terms and conditions should be administered and we found that they abrogated their responsibilities in a very significant way over a long period of time. So in other words, we felt that uh, they've perhaps outlived their usefulness and they'd be better off being uh, absorbed within the Department of Education and that's another way of cutting costs. Deli Waigeno, National MTV News. Health issues and challenges affecting the delivery of health services around the country will soon be presented in Parliament. This special health sector management report began following a parliamentary inquiry. It was prepared by the Special Parliamentary Committee on Public Sector Reform and Service Delivery. Eric Haropma with this report. Special Parliamentary Committee on Public Sector Reform and Service Delivery Chairman Pire Kimisopo said managing the health sector is a big issue. And the onus is on the national government and the health department on how to address these issues. Following a parliament inquiry, the committee has prepared a health sector management report. This uh, presentation of the final, final report on health sector management is basically uh, the parliament, parliamentary committee's um, um, investigation into the way we deliver public health right throughout this country. This report contains recommendations surrounding the delivery of health services from the hospitals down to the aid post. It will assist the health department to effectively implement health services to fulfill the government's commitment to the health sector. He said many people have been faced with the adversity of accessing medical supplies in the rural areas because of poor health facilities. In general, the report uh, attempts to canvass the broad issues affecting delivery of health. Uh, from the main hospitals, referral hospitals, specific, uh, specific hospitals right down to the aid post. This includes both the government and privately run institutions. He said this report does not duplicate the portfolio of the minister concern, however it provides another alternative for the government and concern authority to address health issues in the country. Eric Arupma, National MTV News. Oro Governor Gary Jufa says the government has failed to set up a policing concept to safeguard tourists. This comes after the 2013 attack of tourists on the Black Cat Track and the recent attack in January on the Kokoda Track. Meanwhile, a new report by the Australian News Agency on the attack of the two tourists in Kokoda has highlighted major flaws. A recent online news report highlighted key facts given by Matthew Yvonne and Michelle Clements that did not add up. The report showed that the couple had left a debt totaling up to 80,000 kina. It highlighted reports from key eyewitnesses who met the couple upon arrival in the country and the couple's ignorance for cultural and traditional beliefs. Yesterday, oral governor Gary Jufa said the report by the couple has put Papua New Guinea in the world stage for all the wrong reasons and thanked the online Australian news agency for the investigative report that has now cleared the name of the people of Kokoda. It came out, uh, their investigative reporting has revealed and exposed that this was a scam, that it wasn't true. And so I just want to commend the, uh, the, the media for exposing this. The medical report from the doctor showed signs of sexual penetration, but no signs of rape. Jiffa said her unwillingness to hand in the key report that would prove what happened showed there was something to hide. And uh, the doctor said the lady had refused to allow the uh, the medical report to be made available. The medical report is very important because that is the report that will detail exactly what happened. Governor Jufa also said that it shows the O'Neill government had not kept their word on setting up tourist police. The policing concept become a reality so that tourists would feel comfortable and secure when they came to Papua New Guinea. This has never happened. To date, there is no tourism policing concept in place. Meanwhile, the two suspects charged for the alleged rape of the female tourist are currently being held at the Bumana prison, awaiting their third preliminary hearing on April 20th. Merlin Diaukatam, National MTV News. 
the revocation of the appointment of the National Cultural Commission Acting Executive Director, Dr. Simet, has been questioned. Dr. Simet expressed dissatisfaction by the actions taken by Minister Responsible, Justin Chichenko. Meanwhile, Dr. Simet said the proposed amalgamation for National Cultural Commission and the National Museum is not workable. On Wednesday this week, Minister for Tourism, Arts and Culture Justin Chuchenko announced Ennis's decision for the revocation of Dr. Jacob Simet as the acting executive director for the National Cultural Commission. Minister Chuchenko made it clear that it was a NEC decision. The CEO for quite a while, uh, NEC decided that um, he's um, had uh, enough time in that position, he's done his best in that position. And the situation is his appointment is uh, now being revoked. However, that decision has not gone down well with Dr. Simet, who says formal processes were not followed. Do I walk away from this job? No one has bothered to tell me. And we have not really been advised formally huh? on, on, on these uh, developments. Dr. Simet Feder gave his stand on the proposed amalgamation of NCC and the National Museum Gallery, stating past experiences with similar changes were unsuccessful when merging institutions. The announcement by Minister Responsible Justin Chachenko has shocked both the staff and board members of the National Cultural Commission. So basically at the moment we don't know uh, what has happened because we don't have a copy of the NCDC or anything in writing about the position of the... <coughs> Uh, executive director and also the board whether we, we had suspended or terminated. Thompson also welcomed the proposed investigation into the funds used in the 5th Melanesian Arts Festival held in 2014. We have given the report, the article plus the report of the festival which totals up to 34 million kina. We gave it to Honorable Boka Kondra. For now, Dr. Simet says he will be in office until given a formal letter by those in authority. Jagla Pave Jr. National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. Among stories after the break, Unitec graduation in Leigh and the UNRE graduation in East New Britain. Stay with us. Welcome back to National MTV News. A festivity of colour today at the University of Technology with more than 900 students graduating with diplomas and degrees in various fields from the university. The group included two students who were awarded posthumous degrees after they passed away prior to graduating. Outside of Australia and New Zealand, Unitech is the only other engineering university. For the 920 graduates, today marked the end of one chapter and the start of another. Since the 1960s, the University of Technology has been at the forefront of educating young Papua New Guineans with technical and engineering skills. 14,000 students have graduated over the years. A heartbreaking moment for those who attended. The mother of Leo Miria attended the graduation on behalf of his son, carrying the gown he was supposed to wear. Leo Miria was one of two former students awarded posthumous degrees after they passed away months before the graduation. This year, the numbers have been far less than in previous years. 400 students graduated in absentia. Unitec's vice chancellor pointed out that the university is also phasing out diploma programs, but is increasing postgraduate numbers. It now has 200 postgraduate students, including 12 international students. Today, the message was about service, research and increasing innovation. While universities struggle every year to make space, those who are fortunate to come here have another daunting challenge that faces them. Engineering students in particular will be entering a job market that is experiencing stagnant growth. But they've been challenged to push the boundaries of innovation and to go out and create jobs. Scott Wyde, National MTV News, Lay. Dame Meg Taylor has been awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Technology in recognition of her ongoing work. The long-serving lawyer diplomat who served in various capacities since her first job during the formation of government in 1975 delivered an evocative speech that urged a life of service. The Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum said young Papua New Guineans needed to follow their passion and seize opportunities. 
The University of Natural Resources and Environment in the East New Britain province held its graduation ceremony this week. The university's 19th graduation saw a total of 172 students graduate with master's, degrees, bachelor's and certificates in agriculture studies. It is one institution in the country that produces a cream of agriculturalists to work in the country's natural resources sector. The graduation ceremony yesterday was a colorful event. Friends and families of the graduating students turned up early for the 9 a.m. start to the preceding. The 19th graduation of the university saw 172 students graduated with their awards in their various fields of studies. The master's degree and certificate in management, the bachelor and diploma of tropical agriculture and the bachelor and diploma of fisheries marine resources. I'd like also to acknowledge and recognize after four years of after four years of um, the administration team, led by Acting Vice-Chancellor Dr. Samson Laup, has tried to mold and shape the university to meet the workforce demand in the country's natural resource industry. There are many graduates from this university who are out there in the workforce, in the circular working environment, that have ventured out, they built the foundation here and ventured out into the world contributing to the development of the nation. The pathway taken by the university to make this year's graduation ceremony a success was not an easy one. A series of student protests over allegations of ill management within the administration has been common over the last two years, and it has been a slow and painful experience for both the students and the administration. Yesterday, during the graduation ceremony, the graduates were reminded yet again about the importance of agriculture in the country and how they are to use their knowledge to help change the life of the 80% of ordinary Papua New Guineans living in the village through subsistence agriculture. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. The Indonesian government has encouraged trade with Papua New Guinea, given the advantage of the two countries sharing the same border. This eventuated after the director of Mamase Governor's Secretariat, Andrew Ada, whose office is based in Madang, initiated a Bahasa Indonesian language speaking program. This will now lead to interested Madang women attending a food manufacturing trade fair in August this year in Indonesia. Rachel Shisei with this report. The Indonesian Education Attaché, Dr. Eddie Malatunam, on behalf of the Indonesian government has pledged to support the Bahasa speaking program in Medang and has donated a laptop, a projector and dictionaries to help students who are currently attending the Bahasa classes. The students consist of adult locals, mostly women, who are interested in learning the language to be able to communicate with the Indonesia people and gain knowledge on their manufacturing skills so that they can turn food like sago and other vegetables into noodles, flour and many more. The students' task now is to learn Bahasa by heart and have their passports ready before August to attend a trade fair in Indonesia. There are certain gates where you cannot uh, access with free visa because the system is not in uh, place yet. For example, in uh, Fanimo, get into Jayapura, we haven't set up the online system. And therefore, to get into Jayapura from here, you still need a visa. The Deputy Provincial Administrator, Paul Adam, who's also a Bahasa student, is encouraging interested locals to attend as a way forward in the national government's small-medium enterprise program. To, to the public, especially the women's group and youth groups, uh, those who are involved in the formal, informal sector to come and attend the class. The Indonesia Education Attaché also mentioned in his visit that the Tusbab Secondary School and the Holy Spirit High Schools in Medang have expressed their interests in including Bahasa classes in their curriculums. I had already follow up with Jakarta and then they will send a teacher trainer in Bahasa Indonesia. 
for four months. That teacher, trainer, I have already planned to place him in here and then he will teach the local people that we will hire from PNG to continue teaching Bahasa Indonesia into these two schools. Rachel Shise, National MTV News, Medang. And now a look at the finance news. The Kina closed 10 points lower at 0.3225 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, the Kina was buying 0.3150 US dollars, 0.4076 Australian dollars, 0.2737 Euro and 35.18 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, coffee and copra closed higher, while gold and cocoa closed the day lower. Palm oil, crude oil and copper closed the day lower. And on the stock markets, the Dow Jones closed at 31.57 points lower, the ASX closed at 83.39 points lower, and the All Ordinaries closed at 77.99 points lower. More local and international news after the break, including a CNN report on saving the ancient ruins of Syria. Stay with us. Welcome back to National MTV News. Police Minister Robert Atiyafa has bluntly told Parliament the force has no proper policy guideline. Minister Atiyafa said the Police Management Act currently used must be abolished. The police minister made this statement following questions by Kairuku MP Peter Isoaimo over rotation of police officers in district stations. Minister Atiyafa regrettably told Parliament the force has been acting upon the Police Management Act over the 40 years. He said crime and lawlessness is rife and the force is struggling to address all these issues. You know that policy paper, one kind of some defense force, you got white paper for the police for the last 40 years. Uh, policy paper is tough and by giving uh, looks available on him how police force he can go. The police minister revealed this when Kairuku Iri MP Peter Iso Aimo questioned the duration of police officers across stations in his district and parts of the country. Uh, department, you got planned long, time frame or rotation long, posting or tenure long, one one policeman long, one one district or province long, country or no god. Heavy blow, all police or rotation, now transfer, I mean. Uh, not possible at this stage because of the funding. And like other government departments, the police minister said funding remains a challenge for the force to perform its operations. Meanwhile, the police minister said the force is now under immense pressure due to the decrease in the number of investigative officers. Plenty of uh, investigators, all CID, all fraud, plenty of line blow, you mean, all the same work penis, either all the lapoon, or uh, plenty of people only die or lose work because of long recent. Jack Lepave, Jr. National MTV News. Lay police have made changes to its structure and manpower in the hope of addressing inefficiencies. Mobile squad members are now involved in general policing duties. Lay Metropolitan Commander Anthony Wagambi Jr. said the task force unit has also been given additional manpower combining the armed reserve unit under one commander. The foot beat units has also formed the response team to back up other response units. The lay command has also created an operational wing within the lay central police station. This is where the mobile squad commander has been given an office to work in. All operational armed units have been allocated office spaces in one area along with the superintendent operation and lay central police station commander with their own conference room. This has allowed better coordination in operational matters. We have uh, made that, that area, the old metrops office, into the operation wing. So that's where the superintendent operation sits down there with the station commander lay. And then we have the task force base there and the uh, mobile squad base there. So everybody is here, we all coordinated well. So you'll find it now policing long, we've long, especially the armed units are more coordinated. We used to work in isolation past them separately, but now they're all working together. 
uh, plus our food bid units. These changes are also part of the re-strategizing Balay police in combating crime in the city. Lay Metropolitan Commander Anthony Wagambi said it is important that crimes committed in the city are brought down to a manageable level. Policing is very important. We need to create a conducive environment for everybody to live in, for business and for our ordinary citizens. So women and children must feel, feel free to walk, to walk about. Uh, public must feel free to walk around. Business must feel free to operate, which will create more employment and then the crime rate will drop. We cannot stop crime altogether. When there are people living together, there's always bound to be problems. But if we try to minimize them, nah, uh, manage them. There needs to be a collaborative effort to create a conducive environment, not only for businesses, but for all citizens in the city. And the Lake Command has plans in place to achieve this task, but they will need the support of the police Iraqi and the Morobe provincial government. Mata Lewis, National MTV News, Lay. Community leaders from Lay District have revealed law and order work at the community level has slowed down due to funding constraints. Law and Order Chairman Sam Oyaya says works carried out by peace mediating officers in the communities require more logistical assistance. More than 200 community peace officers scattered in Lay help the district to weed out petty crimes and solve conflicts. Despite the funding constraints faced, this Law and Order Committee plans to do community awareness targeting youth in communities. Two months ago, the committee announced that a community rule would give a 300 kina cash reward for reports of anyone producing homebrew. Part of the community awareness activities this year focuses on the disadvantages of homemade alcohol. Lay's Law and Order Chairman is, however, concerned that there is no transport, allowance, and peace mediators uniforms available to fully carry out their responsibilities. So was one Lamani working team in homebrew, and me play been talk also and by uh, somehow we must help him out. Now, Usat and me seriously and me commit him uh, on uh, serious uh, crime in Lay City. And me commit him to the police and by eviction and, and number one priority in Blood Game. Solution long, a peace by coming to the land. Over 200 community peace mediators work daily to maintain order in communities. It is a role that helps identify crime and resolve conflicts at the community level. Some of the peace mediators say more can be done if all resources are available. Plenty of levies have come up. Then we plan to go display something and we plan to have a hard logo. Then we plan to get car, we plan to get money, we plan to can move around. This is more legal report also. I can give it. The community awareness activities will be launched later on this year, but will only happen when the district is ready to meet logistic costs. Colin Barilai, National MTV News, Lay. Turning overseas and Brussels is still on edge just a week after the terror attacks. There are major concerns militants could target the city again. This CNN report shows disturbing evidence found on computers and the clues Belgian authorities have missed. The Belgian capital reeling from the devastation of last week's terror attacks and now bracing for another possible strike. A source close to the investigation tells CNN photographs and plans for a number of Belgian government buildings were found on a computer belonging to Ibrahim El Bakrawi, who's believed to have blown himself up at the Brussels airport. The computer discovered in a garbage can outside the terror cell's bomb factory in Brussels. The buildings on the computer suggest that at one point this was a larger plot. They recovered um, photos and plans uh, of the Prime Minister of Belgium's office uh, in Brussels, suggesting uh, that that was uh, targeted potentially by the cell, or they were looking to target uh, that in an attack. Security at the Belgian Parliament building is also stepped up over information that it could be the next target. And new questions about clues Belgian authorities missed before the bombings last week. CNN has learned the Belgians had been looking for Ibrahim and Khalid El Bakrawi, the brothers who blew themselves up at the train station and the airport, months before the Brussels attacks. Belgian officials say in December, this red notice from Interpol went out seeking the arrest of Khalid El Bakrawi on terrorism charges. They were looking for his brother on suspicions of criminal activity. Where Belgian authorities failed, they simply couldn't find the brothers. 
they were hiding in plain sight in Brussels in an apartment in the Scarbeck district uh, where the bombs were made. The Belgians clearly did not know this. Another missed clue. Last summer, Turkey deported Ibrahim El Bakrawi after he was arrested near the Syrian border. According to a top Belgian broadcaster, the Belgians asked the Turks if Ibrahim was involved in terrorism. They were told he was known for criminal activity, but it's not clear how much more information the Turks gave the Belgians. Obviously, it turns out that he was a, a hardcore jihadist. The fact that they're not sharing the exact information and have the, law, the laws to actually uh, put these guys into jail uh, suggests that there's a, there's a huge miscommunication between intelligence agencies, between law enforcement. And another major clue seems to be still eluding Belgian authorities. CNN is told Belgian officials do not know where this man is. The third terrorist at the Brussels airport, the man in white. He is believed to have left a bomb there and then taken off. CNN is also told Belgian officials don't know who he is. And there is major concern now that this man, along with more than half a dozen other suspects from the same terror cell, still at large, could be planning another attack. The Syrian regime is counting recent wins such as Palmyra from ISIS. And while the city is strategically located, it's known around the world for its historic importance and ancient ruins. The Syrian government, back in control, is looking at what is being lost and what can be salvaged. The face of history in Palmyra chipped away by ISIS militants. Part of the terror group's cultural cleansing campaign. Palmyra's museum reportedly transformed into an ISIS courthouse. Images from inside reveal the destruction that ISIS had boasted about since last May. Statues toppled, rubble lining the museum hallways. Some of these cultural treasures are 2,000 years old. The Arch of Triumph once framed the entrance to the city. Now it lies in ruins, but there is hope. Specialists are already at work creating a replica. The Palmyra Castle, sitting high atop its hill, was damaged also. The walls crumbling and stained from explosions. And satellite images in August confirmed the fate of the Temple of Bell. The main building now a pile of dust from the sky. Compared to 2008, when CNN flew over the ruins, this week, Drone footage taken after the recapture of the city offered a different view. ISIS did not completely erase history. Some experts say they're surprised the damage wasn't worse. Today, I can confirm you that I am the happiest person in the world. Syria's antiquities chief says they'll rebuild the temples, with Russia and UNESCO offering their help. But there's no recovering from the human atrocity. Hundreds of lives were lost in Palmyra, including the 82-year-old retired head of antiquities, publicly executed by ISIS for refusing to reveal where valuable artifacts were kept. Now, as the city is secured, experts hope artifacts can be restored to their historic value. You're watching National MTV News. True Guys Sports is next. We'll be back with all the details after the break. Don't go away. Two Kai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. To football and coming off the back of a second NSL title, Lay City Dwellers are now turning their focus to their upcoming Oceania Champions League matches. With half of the squad also returning back from international duty, the Dwellers are full of belief as they make their debut in the region's biggest club competition. The 2016 season of the Telecom National Soccer League mimicking last year as Lay City Dwellers became only the second club in the competition's history to win back-to-back -back NSL titles. And this season phenomenal in the sense that only seven days after being walloped by five goals would come back to defeat overwhelming favourite Sakari United. That feat earning a number of the squad the opportunity for national duties, a boost that head coach Peter Gunemba is hoping to capitalise on. It's been a long time and with the inclusion of my players, uh, they uh, happen to beat uh, what's them, Solomon Island. 
Well, winger Obed Bika was only one of six Lay City Dwellers players to make his debut for the national team. Ready, yeah. Striker Nigel Dabinyaba also acknowledges that the experience will most likely improve City's chances in the Oceania Champions League. You may play low NSL goal on a time goal or international level, yeah. Two play game you play playing, but big play experience all the same low. How about me play and only me play at low time only come up, yeah. The squad travels out on Monday confident and buoyed by their successes both individually with players being rewarded for good performances throughout the season and also as PNGs of football champions. Jeremy Moggy, National TV Sports, Lay. Still on football, after almost three decades, the victory by Papua New Guinea over the Solomon Islands national team has been labelled historic. These comments were made by Lay City striker Nigel Dabinyaba as he joined his squad mates preparing for their Champions League duties in Auckland, New Zealand. Dabinyaba, who featured alongside strike partner Raymond Gunemba for the national team, says the quality of their experience has been worthwhile. Time you play on Sunday, um, I think most do me play on Mangi, uh, six play me play travel, four play, uh, five play been stuff in Salo first level and take him to the game with captain scoring first goal, uh, Raymond Gunemba scoring first goal, na I want the winning goal, Michael Foster scoring, and um, part of me play got all boys play inside time. We can to us, um, 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 nice play experience, right? To some um, after me play come back one day on play nice play results, right? One day I'll blow got all our play boys. Papua New Guinea Swimming has received 80,000 kina from Bank South Pacific as sponsorship towards the BSP National Aquatic Excellence Program. The presentation was made at the Tarama Aquatic Center. It was with immense pride that we saw the 2015 Pacific Games hosted by our country, with BSP as the major sponsor, finish on a huge successful note. A proud moment in the history of Papua New Guinea and PNG Swimming countrywide as we hosted a world standard event. The National Aquatic Excellence Program under the PNG SI has been active in developing young swimmers to pursue a professional and competitive swimming career. PNG SI President Elizabeth Wells thanked BSP for its continued sponsorship since 2004. It has contributed positively to developing young talents. Your continued support BSP has opened many opportunities for our young generation who have taken up the sport of swimming. Presenting the check, BSP Senior Business Analyst Nancy Knight said BSP is proud of the partnership with PNGSI in supporting junior sports development in and future swimmers of this country. BSP is proud of the partnership with PNGSI in supporting junior sport development in PNG and future swimmers of this country. A notable product of this program is PNG Superfish and BSP brand ambassador Ryan Pinney. He is a great mentor to all young people in sports in the community. Elijah Levitt, National MTV Sports. Still ahead in Trukai Sports, random drug tests for rugby league players in Queensland and a Bosnian refugee giving his all for Canada. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. A rugby league club in Queensland's southern inland has become the region's first football organisation to randomly drug test players. The St George Club said the new policy is hoping to address a major problem with ice in the community that has been forced on them after a horror season. St George is a farming town about 500 kilometres west of Brisbane. And like many such communities across Australia, it has a problem with ice. I've been here all my life, born and bred, um, the last three years. It's just really taken out of the community bad. It's not just St George, this is the thing, it's not just St George, it's everywhere. The drugs even had a devastating impact on the local rugby league club. Last year, 60 A-grade players decided that had enough. Those who remained were stretched to the limit. Well, we pass across. It was frustrating not having a team run on a Thursday night or um, yeah, not knowing what blokes are turning up on the Saturday or Sunday, the game day. Sometimes we're going to get away to games with you know, 13 players or 12 players. Regan Morris has played for St George since he was a kid. He says it's confronting to see young men under the influence of ice out on the field. It's quite scary. Um, they're not worried about trying to play football. They're, 
they're in their own little space, their own little mind, and they're trying to hurt people. And someone will get seriously injured one day if, if it's allowed to continue. After a crisis meeting, the club adopted a random drug testing policy. St George has bought 75 swab and urine test kits at a cost of $1,500. Well, a small club doesn't make money as it is. The best, the best of times is, is you don't walk away much money, but it's expense that we've had to do, otherwise you're not going to have a club. With the club's 100th anniversary fast approaching, officials say they have no choice but to take action. There's a lot of history in this club, as you can see, but the pitches going back to 1921, we're really worried about, you know, this losing all this history. The club president says the policy isn't about catching players out, it's about providing support to those who need it. At the end of the day, we're not out to actually try and point the finger at someone, you're a drug owner, you use drugs. We're there to um, help them and show them, point them in the right direction. Currently, St George is the only club which has introduced the random drug testing policy. The remaining five clubs in the competition will follow suit next year when it becomes mandatory. The Queensland Rugby League is supportive of the regional push. It's a new program and something that hasn't been done before at this level of sport. So, you know, I think it's, it does take a little bit of courage from, from somebody to take that first plunge. Already, word of the club's initiative is spreading. They're the test bunny or they're the trial, if you like, and um, if, if it goes well, I'm sure we'll have a, a number of other clubs, uh, if not whole leagues around our division, certainly, that will um, that will, they'll want to take a program like this up. And about a month out from the first game, the signs are encouraging. Club officials say the pre-season roll-up has been the best in years. A Bosnian-born refugee has now represented Canada in world rugby. Admir Chevanovic accounts his story of fleeing the Balkans war to a better life in Vancouver. And now, how representing his new country in rugby sevens has come to mean everything. I'm Admir Chevanovic. I was born in 1990 in a small town called Vilka Kladusha, Bosnia. It's uh, just by the Croatian-Bosnian border. 92, the war kind of kicked off there, and uh, you really had no option to kind of stay there. At the time, you either left or you took a serious risk of uh, getting killed. Me and my mom, we seek refuge in a small town in Croatia, and uh, from there, my mom applied for papers to Canada, and we were lucky enough to get those papers. And uh, in 94, we uh, flew over on a plane and uh, kind of kicked off our life from there. Me and my mom got the opportunity of a lifetime and we're 100% dedicated to this country. Me and my mom are thinking is we owe this country a lot. So the best way that we could do that is by being the best kind of citizens we could be. And in my shoes, I need to go out and represent my new country and, and obviously in, in the sport that I love. And I need to show Canadians that I'm a proud Canadian and because they gave me and my mom a second chance that I'm gonna go out there and gun for them. Why do you end up playing rugby when you come from a part of the world where football or soccer is so popular? I played soccer all the way up till I was 18 years old, but then after that, uh, rugby kind of took the main focus in my life. I love Rugby Sevens so much is because how much it pushes me. I'm, I'm not your average kind of sevens player. I, uh, I'm one of the bigger guys on the field and I really need to push myself on the pitch mentally and physically. How proud are you going to be wearing the Canadian shirts here in a Vancouver leg of the World Series? It's, to me, it's, it's, I can't wait. And now that I get to show the country what I can do and get to show them how tough the sport really is on the international scale is, is going to be awesome. And then in Shukai Sports, we'll have for you the weather details when we come back. Shukai Sports. True Kai Sports. Taking a look at the weather for the next 24 hours in the southern region, mostly fine in Port Mosby and fine as well in Daru, Kerma, Alotau and Papandeta. To the Momasi region, mostly fine in Lei, Wau and Madang and fine as well in Wiwek and Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, a shower or two expected in Lorengau as well as in Kokopo and Rabaul, and fine weather in Kaviang, Kimbe and Buka. 
And in the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg mostly fine over the next 24 hours. And that's the way it is this Friday, the 1st of April 2016. From the MTV News team, I'm Mary Batulo. Pleasant viewing. Good night.